Hello and welcome back to our exciting medical sciences lecture series. This week's lecture will answer the question, could 3D printing revolutionize our healthcare? Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Anna and I'm currently in my third year on the Applied Medical Sciences course here at UCL and your chair for today's event. Today's fascinating lecture will address how 3D printing is having a transformational effect on the healthcare industry. So what are the opportunities and challenges offered by this exciting technology. So we want to keep these lectures as interactive as possible. So please make good use of Twitter and the Q&A function on Zoom throughout to submit your questions for our speaker. The hashtag to use on Twitter is hashtag FMS lectures. And I'm delighted to now introduce our speaker. So today we have Dr. Deepak Kalaskar. So Dr. Kalaskar is an associate professor of bioengineering and the director of the postgraduate MSc course in burns, plastic and reconstructive surgery at UCL. Prior to his role at UCL, um, he worked as a research and development scientist with the German multinational company BASF Coatings. And due to his interests in biological coatings, he pursued a PhD in the field of biomedical materials from the University of Manchester. So thank you for joining us today. Now over to you, Dr. Kalaska. Thank you very much, Anna. <clears throat> and thanks for the invitation. So uh, the way I laid out, laid out today's lecture is uh, looking at the landscape of 3D printing, where I will briefly cover you the history and innovation for past few decades. Uh, I will talk about 3D printing technology itself because I'm mindful that there will be people in audience who never heard about this technology or know a bit about this technology. So we'll look at some of the uh, terminologies which is used to describe it. Uh, then we will address the questions called 3D printing, revolutionizing manufacturing and how it compares with conventional manufacturing technology, how this has been impacting healthcare. And I will give you certain examples, including our own work, where we have seen different opportunities and also discuss challenges which technology is actually facing. So uh, 3D printing is always making uh, impact in various different manufacturing sectors, including automotive, healthcare, aerospace, and construction industries. These are uh, major industrial sectors, <clears throat> which accounts for the economical input of various uh, countries. And these are side, uh, some of the examples, handful of examples, not limited, uh, where they have been used and commercially adopted and currently being utilized by various uh, uh, industrial, major industrial manufacturer right now, as we speak. <clears throat> However, this is not a new technology. 3D printing uh, has been existing for a while. The first known patent in this field was filed in 1984 by Charles Hulse uh, on stereolithography. From 1980s onward until 2000, there has been multiple developments in 3D printing hardware and softwares, where different types of 3D printing technology has came in existence. They have been innovated, uh, processing different materials, either they could be resin, powder, or systems such as extrusion based or droplet based systems have innovated in that period. So we can quite confidently call that was an era that decade or two was uh, where the boost uh, innovation in 3D printing technology itself happened. Following decade from 2000 till 2016, we seen application of this technology. Now this is a crowded slide. So I will draw your attention to some of the uh, arrows, uh, red arrows, which essentially points out major medical breakthroughs, which has been utilized using 3D printing technology. Uh, the first, very first example of 3D printing technology in medicine was cited in 1999 by Wake Forest Institute, where they used first 3D printed synthetic photo scaffold and coated with a bladder cell. Uh, in 2002, Invision Tech was the first company to launch a bioplot. Now we call it a bioprinter to print tissues. Then there was uh, uh, frequent and rare uh, sort of events happening until 2012. And from 2012 onwards, then there is an explosion of activity, again, uh, utilizing this technology into medicine. Uh, with Oxford Performance Material getting their first FDA approval for uh, patient-specific cranial implant, followed by Apricia Pharmaceutical, 
uh, getting FD approval for first prescribed medicine uh, developed by 3D printing technology. In last uh, few years, from 2015 onwards, there has been a huge development in terms of scaling up production of bioprinting technology itself. And this technology is now slowly picking up and there is a huge interest in the community. We'll talk about some of these as we go along my lecture. Uh, but this is how I would like to represent the information in terms of scientific development and publications over the last few years. And exactly what I articulated before, from 2000 onwards, we can see there is an exponential increase in publications in 3D printing healthcare, whether they are development of new materials, software, imaging technologies, and medical applications. Uh, we are still within three months of 2022 and already more than 1,500 publications are already published in this area, which essentially shows you how much of innovation is happening and how much of interest is there from the community uh, here. So before we move on, let's talk a bit about uh, basic principles of 3D printing. So 3D printing has three main components, hardware, software, and materials. If you can design an object, or you can scan an object, convert that into an STL file, which is an electronic file readable by a 3D printer, you can essentially print it. Now, this is different than conventional manufacturing where we use a casting or molding approach, or we remove the material, uh, whereby we call it subtractive manufacturing to mold an object into a shape. In 3D printing, this is done very differently. Here we are adding material, based on predefined file and a parameter or a CAD model, <clears throat> whereby the material is deposited in a layer by layer fashion. Uh, here's an example of an extrusion based printer where a nozzle is extruding material <clears throat> in a predefined pattern and it lays that material in a three dimensional layer. And this is one of the reasons this is also called alternative as additive manufacturing or a layered manufacturing because it's used for rapid prototyping. It's also called as rapid prototyping quite widely. <clears throat> Solid freeform fabrication is another alternative name for 3D printing. Uh, however, 3D printing is not one technology, it's a class of different technology. And that depends on how we deposit the material, whether we use heat, whether we use uh, lasers, whether we use uh, pneumatic pressure uh, or binding of material on top of each other, they can be divided into different uh, categories. Uh, and there are about seven different categories. I won't be going into details of each of these categories uh, because that will dive down to another one of our lecture. Instead, I will refer to a further reading uh, uh, from a book which I published in 2017 in 3D Printing and Medicine, chapter number two, if you are interested to read more about it. <clears throat> but let's move on to the next question, which is how 3D printing is revolutionizing design and manufacturing. So as I said before, conventional manufacturing is predominantly based on casting and molding, where you, if you are looking at mass production of the same object, they're extremely convenient. However, when we are looking uh, using customization, uh, 3D printing has a lot to offer. And now these are some of the everyday objects where people have been exploring and printing them. Uh, and this is for the first time that the technology which is manufacturing has been so close to the user. If you can design it, you will be able to manufacture them. Uh, looking at everyday objects such as you know, a fancy casing for your mobile phone or a pen holder, there are also innovation in construction where uh, a low cost of dwelling has been produced by uh, an Italian company and now currently being adopted by various different countries uh, looking at developing low cost dwelling using uh, uh, sustainable materials. It's also being adopted into food industry for culinary art at the same time, uh, again, looking at sustainability, uh, reducing the production of meat and its impact on environment. This has been trial and currently being utilized for creating synthetic meat. Uh, is being used quite extensively in fashion industry, in shoe wear industry, and again, that comes back to the customization aspect of it. So in nut and shell, what happened is with this technology, there is a huge amount of freedom to design and manufacture, personalized object, and also personalize the costs so we can use them as and when we require, instead of waiting for centralized manufacturing to be sent out um, to be manufactured or is economically not feasible. 
the same revolution of using this customization and on-demand manufacturing is translating into medicine. There are about six, six different areas where this translation and impact has been quite visible. The first one being surgical planning and training, customized devices and implants, artificial organs, disease modeling, and pharmaceuticals. We'll cover each of these areas and look at their uh, opportunities and challenges. The first is surgical planning, training, and education. Uh, as, as shown you before, uh, we have here a publication, number of publications starting from 2002 onwards, and we can see there is an incremental evidence in terms of uh, publications showing how 3D printing technology has been used for surgical planning and training and education. Predominantly, there has been a, a utilization of this technology in cardiovascular complex surgeries, like cardiovascular surgery, reconstructive facial orthopedic surgeries, oncology, neurovascular aneurysm and transplant surgeries. These are some examples from coming from UCL itself. The first example I want to cite is from my colleague, Dr. Claudio Capelli and his team who are based at UCL Institute of Cardiovascular Science. And uh, he's been doing an interesting work whereby converting an MRI, two-dimensional MRI images into three-dimensional images. And then eventually using those to 3D print various different types of models of complex uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases in order for surgical planning and training. Uh, they have also been using these to test out their devices before they can be used in actual surgery. Uh, this is the group which also did quite interesting work in terms of procuring this uh, lifelike and original models to parents of the patient. And the patient here in Great Ormond Street are hospital are mainly children. So in order to operate on a children, you need to take consent from their parents. They used this model and shown that the parent did understood the complexity of uh, surgeries which their children are going to go and help them to get an easy consent from a patient. Um, they understood the complexity and the impact of those surgeries on their children and their own lives. Uh, within my lab, I have been using this for uh, complex spinal surgery, such as sclerosis, which this is a work done at Royal National Orthopedic Hospital at Stanmore in London and uh, where we have been using our clinical team and helping them in planning complex surgical procedures for uh, spinal surgeries, devising different types of devices which are used to do instrumentation on them. I'll speak about this later at the next section. So if you analyze all this data, which is from 2002 onwards and try to conclude it, we found that uh, using 3D printing in surgical planning, training and education, Preoperatively help in reducing procedural cost by optimizing the method selection, optimizing device selection, and avoid unnecessary intervention. Interoperatively, it helped the physician to reduce the OR time, operating time, uh, anesthesia time, and complications frequency. Uh, after the operations, it helped in faster recovery, reduce admission rate, and improve outcome. If you want to know how this data has been acquired, I would advise you to read the British Journal of Medical uh, Sciences uh, Journal, Systematic Review published in 2017. So overall, the opportunity-wise surgical planning um, using 3D printing has improved for complex surgeries, improved safety and efficacy. In training and education has provided an excellent uh, opportunity to use this for uh, places and labs where access to a human cadaver and weight lab is not accessible. Challenges wise, we're still at uh, very much at innovative stage where uh, there are lack of materials, colors and texture, uh, which can be sutured quite easily, which represent actual human tissue. Uh, we predominantly use X-rays and CT scan for these applications. X-rays and ultrasound are other modalities which are least utilized and there is a huge opportunity to be used for this. However, processing these images is still a challenge. Uh, time and the cost of producing colored uh, surgical models is actually uh, still quite expensive and time consuming process. So these are still remains to be a challenges in terms of full application. <clears throat> now let's move on to the next one, which is the bespoke devices and implants. 
Uh, current implants and devices which we use are comes in the standard shapes and sizes, uh, which create a mismatch in anatomy or a defect to be treated. Uh, this is an example of a radiograph of an oversized uh, spinal implant. Uh, so, however, what uh, approach we have taken in within our group is to create a patient-centered approach, where we not only take into consideration the size, shape, motion, and function uh, which the patient is going to uh, undergo, we also can look into uh, aspects such as cost. If it's an external device, we can consider aesthetic aspect of it. And I will give you some example. The first one being a co-creation of a biomimetic cervical collar for transfer myelitis. Uh, it is a condition which affects patients' central uh, cord syndrome and uh, limits their mobility. The patient which was uh, presented to us around 2018-19 uh, uh, had a severe neck muscle, has a neck muscle weakness. Essentially, it means uh, the patient was unable to breathe uh, they were continuously uh, head down, create a lot of pain in their cervical muscle at the back. <clears throat> to make the, uh, the life even more complicated for this patient is uh, all the, because of the anatomical features which essentially created across their shoulder area, commercial collar were not useful. Um, this actually uh, essentially stopped them from using it. So, we were asked to create a customized collar to see whether we can elevate their pain and also help patients compliance in terms of their treatment because not able to breathe is a very difficult situation and the clinical team was worried about. The patient lived about four hours away from the hospital. And that's the reason by the time they come to the hospital one way for our journey, they were completely tired, not had any energy to talk to us or talk to the clinical team. So we had to come up with an innovative way of collecting their information and their anatomical structure where we use a 3D scanning technology. Instead of asking them to come, we went to them. We capture their information and use a 3D scan where we can see the anatomical structure are being captured in detail. We then use this process to create a process of creating different types of color designs and testing them. And instead of manufacturing them, we will be able to test and optimize them biomechanically using computational process. And after that process is actually been done, we 3D printed these colors and provided to our patient. Uh, the patient were not using any colors. By the time we gave them a color, they started using the color. Uh, this is how their neck look when they were without a collar, and this is after using a collar. So essentially, this had impacted uh, their physical posture, their breathing, and they also had a confidence to look into the eyes when they're talking with the people. So that was a wild, uh, quite happy outcome for this patient. Uh, now, where we are with this? So currently, we are in a process of uh, starting new trials with using similar bespoke design principles for Parkinson's as well as motor neuron disease patients with our associate hospital at UCL. Now, I'll give you a second example where we looked at uh, entirely different uh, facial burn scar management using 3D printing. And in this process, uh, uh, when the patient is faced with a facial burns, <clears throat> it can lead to a, a functional disabilities, aesthetic, but it also has a huge impact on their psychological impairment due to scar. Now, the way the scars are managed after the burns is to do a pressure therapy, whereby uh, a specialist therapy therapist will actually make a bespoke custom-made uh, mask, face mask for them, which need to be wear continuously under pressure to minimize the scarring effect. The current process uh, involves three stages, which is the first is consultation, uh, which lasts about 20 minutes to uh, explain the process and get patient on board to go through uh, the next stage, which is the second visit, where the impression of the mask is actually being taken. Patient lies down and the therapist will take a mask. It's a bit, uh, you will be, the therapist will be touching their skin and being skin being quite sensitive uh, after buds, it's uh, not a very comfortable experience for most of the patient. Followed by that, third visit will be where it will be fitted uh, on the mask. So when I discuss this process with a, a consultant plastic surgeon, uh, Dr. Uh, Faraz al Shomar, and he's also an UCL alumna, uh, worked with us on various different projects. 
actually suggested to use a non-invasive way of capturing their information and physical features by using a mobile phone camera. And nowadays, uh, most of the mobile phone are quite advanced. They come with LiDAR technology, whereby you can accurately scan, but no one has done this before. So we scan and from that scan, we 3D printed the mask for this patient. We created and tested them in two different materials, flexible and slightly hard material, and uh, given it to a patient to see how they respond to it. <clears throat> we found in terms of the comfort score that uh, compared to conventional mask, our uh, semi-rigid mask, 3D printed semi-rigid, were equally comfortable for the patients. Uh, in terms of their compliance in using as long as possible, both were comparable. The conventional as well as 3D printed masks were used as a similar time frame. Uh, in terms of the cost, uh, only looking at the material cost at this stage, the conventional mask and uh, 3D printed mask actually came cheaper than the conventional mask by a few dollars. Obviously, it doesn't involve the time which therapist is actually going to put. In conventional mask, there is more than two hours of total time investment, whereas in the 3D printing, there will be less of a therapist time, there will be more of a manufacturing uh, time which is involved. So in overall, the benefit was we, for first time, able to use a mobile phone uh, instead of using expensive 3D scanner to acquire that information, create a mask at a lower cost and very rapidly and improve patient experience and their comfort using this process. This work is uh, currently under review and will be published soon. Moving on to the instrumentation. Uh, we have been working with the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital on scoliosis surgery, which is a condition affects uh, about two to three percent of children and it uh, comes with a deformed spinal um, spine. Uh, the solution for this is uh, uh, the spinal correction surgery, whereby screws and rods will be utilized to correct the spine to get it a normal position. It's a complex surgical process and also risky in terms of that uh, there will be a multiple radiation exposure involved for these children. So we discussed this process with our clinical team uh, and come up with an innovative way of using this technology where we do bespoke uh, devices being created. We call them pedicle screw uh, placement devices where screws are being uh, placed by using pre-made customized uh, templates. Uh, the process uh, involves about five steps. The first step is being uh, uh, acquiring or already acquired CT or MRI scan from a patient, which we use to plan a surgical process for these patients, which are evaluated and confirmed by the clinical team, followed by we then manufacture the guides. And these guides then later on being tested preoperatively by these two consultant surgeons. And once they are confirmed that uh, <clears throat> the screws are being getting into the right position, then they move on to the next stage of using them in a clinical theater. This work has completed a preclinical uh, trial, and now we are moving to a clinical trial at this stage. The next one and the last one in this series is the patient-specific bone defects. Now, uh, bone loss occurs for various reasons. It could be an accidental injury or it could be cancer-based patients who lose their bones. When off-the-shelf implants become not available or not useful, then you require an alternative. We have been working for the past few years to create an alternative. Uh, by using a 3D printing process where uh, this is a workflow we validated and developed in collaboration with hospital in Belgium, <clears throat> um, where they provided us a CT scan of a bone defect and asked us to print that bone defect in a porous fashion, which represents the bone structure. We printed that and then eventually tested the quality and accuracy of these things. And we found that more than 95% of our uh, uh, designs were accurate, which were surgically acceptable to the clinical team. <clears throat> we also able to screw these devices using uh, uh, screws uh, intraoperatively, uh, which is a major uh, development in this field. We looked at, we have completed a preclinical animal studies using this material and shown that both under load bearing and non load bearing condition. Uh, these implants work very well, and within six weeks, we are able to get new bone formation along with blood vessels there, which is uh, quite encouraging. Uh, we're also able to scale up this production where bigger bone defects can be printed. 
Currently, we are in a conversation with Professor Francesco Giotto from UCL Institute of Eastman Dental School to run a uh, clinical trial for aloe bone grafting, where our focus will be on uh, evaluating shape matching, uh, reducing surgery time, uh, infection rates, and faster recovery using this technology. So apart from our one example, there has been multiple commercial as well as clinical successes. 2013 Oxford Performance Material received FDA approval for first skull implant. After that, there has been series of industries like Stryker, KTM, Zimmer, they got their approval for spinal implants as well. 99% of the hearing aid today are actually custom made. Uh, the estimated market for 3D printed medical devices is estimated to be 1.8 billion by 2028, with the sales projections going up to 16.1 CAGR, which tells you there is a huge opportunity in this area. So in terms of challenges, currently the common modality we use is CT and MRI scanning. Uh, and as said, X-rays and ultrasound are the technique which are used commonly. It remains to be least explored. And these techniques can, has a huge potential which can be exploited, but their processing is still quite challenging. We use a number of softwares uh, to render the images, to 3D print them, and that also leads to creation of error, design errors, and can have an impact on a final uh, printed objects. Uh, and that's something we need to keep in mind as a design team. Uh, commercial software, accurate software, proprietary softwares are available, but they could be off the limit because of their, because of their cost for a um, lot of uh, healthcare providers. Uh, within the printing process, we are still limited to number of materials we can print. Uh, the cost is not always low because this is a bespoke uh, designs and processes and delivery times can last between a few days to a few weeks. Let's move on to the next part, which is the pharmaceutical research and how we are using 3D printing. So 3D printing mainly being utilized in this for variable drug versus formulations, complex delivery systems, and designing new molecules. Uh, this is an example where FFF technology, which is fused filament, uh, filament uh, fusion technology has been used for printing different infill density tablets to design complex delivery systems and understand them. As an example, where SLA technology has been used uh, and printed in hydrogel uh, combined with aspirin. <clears throat> uh, the interesting development has been happening, uh, which we were unable to do previously, is to look at creating something called polyfill. Uh, my uh, father, he is actually suffered from type 2 diabetes, and essentially he takes about 10 tablets in a day. Uh, and he has to remember when he has to take, and he still needs to recall that he has taken all of them, uh, keep a track of it. How about having a one single tablet which essentially have all the three doses, all the 10 doses within? So this concept is now evolving and whereby we are first time able to use 3D printing technology. And because of 3D printing, we are able to explore that idea. Uh, this itself, it is still far from being reality, but now that process has already started, there is a lot of experimentation happening within the scientific community. <clears throat> a very recent example, an innovating example that came across very recently from Royal National Institute of Blind, where they printed tablets with the burial pattern surface to aid uh, visually impaired patients. And this is an innovation. This is an interesting way you can benefit uh, the uh, you know the less able people uh, giving uh, benefit of 3D printing uh, so they can uh, be very much independent in terms of their medication. There are also been various uh, there are also been uh, commercial successes like first uh, epilepsy fast dissolving tablet actually been commercialized and received FDA approval uh, by and commercialized by Appreciate Technology. Uh, so that shows us there is a huge opportunity. There is also scalability potential um, for this technology to print tablets. However, the real opportunity lies on on-demand printing of custom drugs and doses. Uh, there is obviously challenges that 3D printing project cannot process all different types of chemical ingredients. Uh, this is very well suited and where low volume drug is required, where conventional manufacturing is not justified. However, we have to be uh, quite wary about the regulations and how they will impact because most of the regulations has been for the conventional manufacturing process. So we'll have to be mindful of those things. 
democratization uh, democratization of the drug production is a real opportunity but also there is a risk of counterfeiting or illegal drug formula uh, production uh, adjusting a drug based on patient specific requirement is a good opportunity which also required to be uh, which also provides a huge benefit for personalized medicine and pharmaceutical research uh, said so also about the pharmaceutical research now moving on to the last and very interesting part which is tissue and organ uh, printing is bioprinting now how this is different from the other printing process is that instead of just printing material here we are mixing materials with cells and printing them together in a three dimensional fashion most of our tissues in human body are 3d at a cellular level if you are looking at even a skin is a three dimensional structure there's a layer of different types of uh, cellular structures which are uh, built in a hierarchical fashion by using a 3d printing and using patient bone cell we will be able to personalize this tissue to create a bespoke therapy which essentially provides an opportunity for using those personalized tissue for drug discovery disease modeling and ultimately for organ or tissue transplantation uh this is how the conventional approach in terms of uh, drug development or therapeutic development looks like so once the discovery happens the current approach is to put it through series of small and large animal trials before it ends up into a human trial now this is not only a long but also quite expensive process and to make uh, the matter uh, again complicated uh, the animals do not share a uh, genetic makeup very similar to humans they are very different so most of the and pathophysiologically also they are different so most of the drugs which are being tested and found to be uh, working on the animal 90% of them never make a true human trial so essentially what we really need is a much more clever way of developing and using 3d printed by uh, 3d printed tissues or humanized tissues for this application now with a bioprinting there is a new opportunity which is to use bioprinted in vitro human tissue models to uh, to achieve the same goal but here the advantage would be because these tissues been created using uh, human cells they will be more targeted and hopefully the success rate will be much higher but that's the hope and there is a huge amount of work which has been going on my group itself has been working on this field uh, in creating different types of innovative bioinks which are material to process cells and print them we have been working in collaboration with industry and academic partners to develop printers and medical imaging technology in 2018 we received funding from british council to launch an international educational and research platform for bioprintingresearch.org <clears throat> which is a platform uh, to connect people who are interested into this field so if you are interested please go and visit and you will find a lot more information so coming to the development of work we have done we, our main focus has been on synthetic material uh, free from animal materials of animal origin which are easy to bioprint and at the same time can be tailored in their physical and biological properties and chemical properties and can be printed into complex shapes and design for soft as well as hard tissue regeneration and the first example is being the vascular network uh, in terms of application uh we have developed a material and a vascular network uh, or having a vasculature is one of the bottleneck in terms of having creating in vitro tissue either for transplantation or even for disease model applications they won't survive if there is no blood vessels into it for a longer duration and this is the reason we have been trying to address this problem by using this technology uh and what we see here is uh, a process where we have been able to create uh different types of uh, blood vessel blood like structure or vascular structure uh, blood vessel like structure uh using this technology where they are hollow and we are able to uh, perfuse them with a blood like solution um we are currently in a process of cellularizing them by using endothelial and smooth muscle cell which are uh, the ingredients of the blood vessel itself so that they can be used to study either various types of cardiovascular diseases or they can be further exploited down the line for using in uh, uh, tissue for transplantation application uh, the other area where uh, we have been exploring because of our background into 
hard and soft tissue regeneration is to create in vitro the disease models uh, for osteoarthritis. Now, this is an example where uh, we have been uh, printing uh, cartilage tissue and the bone tissue uh, differently. Uh, on the top uh, layer, you see uh, cartilage cells actually being mixed with uh, hydrogels and they are being printed. Whereas at the bottom, you are seeing uh, hydroxyapatite is being printed and later on seeded with osteoblast cells. These two mechanically distinct tissues are later on combined together to create an osteochondral tissue model. And then this model is then used to study by inducing chemically or physically an osteoarthritis phenotype into it. Uh, Patricia has done a quite uh, optimization of cartilage and bone tissue independently, and she will be soon moving on combining these two tissues together to create first osteoarthritic model, which is bioprinted. Uh, so moving on to and concluding towards this part of bioprinting, uh, we can certainly see there has been incremental increase in terms of publication output in this area. Uh, however, there are challenges in terms of printing technology. I mean, so resolution and the speed are inversely proportional. If you're looking for a higher resolution, you won't get the speed of printing. There are volumetric 3D printing technologies which are currently being coming. Uh, however, they're still at their infancy and they're slowly evolving. Uh, and I'm sure that problem will eventually be addressed. Uh, however, most of our understanding about biology has been a two-dimensional field in a 2D. Now, getting access to a 3D printing technology to create multicellular uh, tissue is exciting, but at the same time challenging because now we need to uh, we need uh, advanced level of imaging and analytical technique to quality control those tissues to understand what we started and what we want to achieve. We are actually achieved it using it. Uh, presumably, once we achieve a point and we acquire a tissue which we require, there are also regulatory challenges if we are talking about human application, human translation. Uh, currently, there is no defined uh, regulatory regulation in terms of bioprinting, uh, but it is anticipated they will be based to very much similarly on APMPs or stem cell therapies. Uh, it is anticipated that this technology or the tissue will come uh, very much in the beginning will be quite expensive. There are ethical as well as concerns over inequality. Uh, that means who will be able to access them? Will uh, this will be only accessible for the people who can pay for it? What will be the model in terms of insurance? How people are going to access? These are some of the challenges which are currently require to be debated, and there is a work in progress in this area. Uh, however, there are uh, opportunities whereby we can see that BASF and City Biotech has been working on functional. Uh, scheme for models using 3D printing, which can be used essentially for testing different types of cosmetic drugs and products. Aspect Biosynthesis has landed $1 million, uh, um, $1 million investment to create and commercialize uh, human tissue, which also shows a huge amount of commercial activity in this area. So just to summarize everything what we talked about is there are about six different areas where 3D printing has been making its mark especially because of its aspect of freedom to design and manufacture, which is not there when we are looking at conventional manufacturing. Where there is a need for customization and personalization, this technology has been offering a lot in terms of surgical planning, device and implants development. Uh, in, it has also shown an evidence of increasing patient safety within surgical planning and training. By using uh, these tissues for printing, we are able to use and reduce animal usage, do more ethical research and development. Um, there is a way to reduce the cost, but however, the cost reduction won't be immediate. They will take a while when uh, large scale manufacturing will happen. Redistributed manufacturing and uh, democratization of drugs and access to devices is a real opportunity using 3D printing. However, there are challenges. As I said before, printing technology, the materials development, software and imaging technology has to evolve in parallel. We are using and we are making steady state progress, as we can see from a number of publications which are happening over years and years. Uh, there is also a challenge in terms of having uh, uh, quality control and standardization in terms of testing of personalized devices and implants, and now coming to uh, biological tissues, which are required uh, for human applications. 
there are also challenges in terms of skills man and woman power because uh, women power because not many people in this field actually fully skilled they are coming from different multidisciplinary areas and acquiring these skills um, as I spoken about regulations, the regulation of all devices, pharmaceuticals or tissues, they vary geographically. So if you are trying to explore this area, it's important for you to understand the challenges and the regulation within your demographic. Intellectual property and copyright is again a quite interesting area where who owns the images, who owns the product, those are the debating factors which are been going on. There is a huge amount of clarity now uh, uh, is available on this topic, uh, especially when we are looking at the commercialization aspect of 3D printing technology. The real uh, benefit will only be able to see when hospitals and healthcare providers are actually adopt this technology, where the social and uh, economical benefits will then be passed on to the patients. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, finish my lecture and acknowledge the postdocs, the PhD students, the visiting researcher, uh, academic and international collaborator who have been working and supporting our research for you know, several years and the funding bodies who have uh, extensively supported and uh, encourage our research for years. Uh, with that, thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalaskar, for such an interesting lecture on such an exciting area of science. Um, we also managed to gain like a really good insight into UCL's latest research and design and development of like personalized devices and implants um, and bioprinted tissues as well. Um, so you can submit your questions and Dr. Kalaskar will be very happy to answer them. So now onto the Q&A, we do have uh, one question. So previously you mentioned um, several challenges in 3D bioprinting. Um, so I think a good question to ask is what are the challenges of maintaining uh, sterility for implanted devices? So um, it's known that gamma radiation can be used for non-biologic materials with consideration for material stability. So what are the strategies used for bioprinting uh, which cannot be gamma uh, irradiated? Um, that's an interesting question yeah, because this has to be looked at differently than implants. And when you are processing uh, 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 any living material, uh, the process and the protocols are standardized. Uh, it's not the first time we'll be using stem cell or cell based therapy. They're already existing. Those protocols are still there. The standardization is still there. We'll be borrowing those. So to answer these questions, uh, very simply, you start from the beginning itself with everything sterilized material and your cells are also sterilized. They are being printed into a sterilized and uh, medically approved uh, facility uh, and they are being then transplanted and uh, sort of transported to a theater in the same uh, way in a sterile format. Um, so you will be starting your process uh, and the sterility from the beginning itself. It's not that you print and then you sterilize. No, you will have to start from the beginning. So there is a large uh, level of logistics and a quality control which will involve, uh, which also means uh, this uh, 3D bioprinting and their application also comes with its challenges. And there will be a lot of learning process uh, because this is a new technology. There are not many, there are not uh, actual applications where bioprinted product has currently been implanted. So once this happens, there will be a pioneering questions and answers will come out. Uh, but as I foresee, it will be the first step where we actually address sterilization. It's not later we address the sterilization. I see. So um, also in terms of um, 3D bioprinting being a very new technology in kind of the science space, um, could you also expand on the 3D printing possibilities for Parkinson's since we know that 3D bioprinting can be applied in certain neural networks and so on? Yeah, it's again an interesting question. You know, uh, as I said about uh, any diseases where we have a lack of understanding and the diseases are three-dimensional, uh, we will be able to 
develop these tissue models. So we are looking at uh, 3D printing of neurons. And that's, again, a quite interesting uh, area where uh, a lack of work actually uh, there. There is not enough work which is being published in this area. There is a huge interest in this area. Uh, by the time uh, we develop these tissue models, uh, we will be able to then experiment different types of drugs on them before they can actually be prescribed to a patient. Uh, there could be an element of uh, personalization and optimization of the drug doses. Uh, if there is no drug formulation or medical uh, treatment available, uh, these 3D printing models also provides a platform to do those research and development activities from the beginning itself. Uh, the most important point and the uniqueness would be is we will be using humanized tissue. Instead of testing these therapies on animal models, which essentially are redundant and won't be applicable, using them on a bioprinted human tissue, which is taken from a patient itself and then 3D printed to create those model will help us to then evaluate effectiveness of this technology and fast track it. Right, and you also mentioned that um, 3D printing is used a lot in the production of drugs. And so um, how will the use of 3D printing to support with uh, drug production affect the cost of everyday medicines? Uh, I think uh, 3D printing is still a new uh, as far as it has to compete with uh, any conventional manufacturing technology as far as drug cell production is concerned. Uh, this is specifically being used where a specialized drug formulation uh, is required. It is not competing with conventional manufacturing and it has certainly has a potential for a niche areas uh, where conventional manufacturing is not efficient. And also in relation to what you mentioned about um, human tissues with uh, 3D bioprinting, um, there's a question that asks about um, the opportunities and also the current challenges of printing functional prosthetics. So um, for example, uh, printing a layer of cells to create new tissue. Okay. Uh, what is exactly the question there? So the question is, um, would you know of any opportunities or current challenges of printing functional prosthetics? For example, uh, printing a layer of cells to create new tissue, uh, tissue such as a functional heart. Yeah, okay, I get it. So I think uh, uh, there has been, uh, I would say not the link research totally. There has been a work on prosthetic and devices and customization of those devices for patient. Uh, there has been a separate work going on within creating interfaces, uh, which links with implant. And I think those two things can be borrowed out quite uh, easily, whereby a custom prost prosthetic devices with an interface uh, can be created. Um, I think it's an, it, it is a very interesting idea. And um, I have not come across an actual example as such so far. Uh, but. I'm sure uh, people are actually looking at into it because this definitely provides a real opportunity to use it. But it also comes with these challenges. Yeah, because it's so new. And so um, we've talked about how kind of revolutionizing um, 3D bioprinting can be, um, but have we actually seen any applications that have made true impacts on patients' lives that you know about? Yeah, so one example we quoted as such from creating a bespoke, the main area where there has been a true impact is in prosthetic devices, implants, because this is already commercially available the worldwide. There are lots of people who have benefited by this technology. Uh, we have not seen a major activity in terms of organs and tissues so far. Uh, the impact has already been uh, using prosthetic devices and implants. And this is where I think uh, we will, we, there are lots of success stories. There is not one, there is a lot of success stories. Uh, we, our group itself has been working on class one till class three devices. And I cited example of uh, 3D printed neck collar, um, the class three device such as the face mask for burns patients, uh, which is being utilized. We are also working on feasibility trials and instrumentation, which are bespoke and created for very complex surgery and they're not available off the shelf. And these are definitely helping patient as well as the clinical team to improve the safety and efficacy of their operations. And so um, 
on to kind of linking back to those examples. Um, how do you envision this 3D bioprinting capability becoming a part of a streamlined process or a workflow, say 10 or 15 years from now? Or will it stay very much academic and only meeting the needs of only a few patients? Uh, again, a very important and very interesting questions. Uh, I think uh, as far as the streamlining of this process is concerned, there are lots of industries which are already adapted. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are uh, Zimmer and other big companies who are quite widely uh, using these technologies and fully established technologies, which are being using it for manufacturing medical implants and devices uh, since 2012 onwards. Uh, so the adoption and the process itself will fully establish. The custom devices is something is also there. There are small scale industries which are being developing custom implants and custom devices and providing to, to wide and different variety of patients from cranial applications till uh, lower limb applications, uh, broken uh, uh, you know, bones. Uh, we ourselves have been working on uh, regeneration of the bone itself and customizing those defects so off the shelf solution can be available for these patients. So uh, to answer that in a short, the applications are already there, the workflows are already being optimized. Uh, where it becomes quite interesting is when uh, these are bespoke or these are non bespoke. That means whether these are standardized product, which are a same shape and size of the shell product or they have been customized. When that question comes, then we have to look into local regulations, how we are going to manufacture them, how we are going to quality control them. Um, and that is the aspect of the interesting conversation. And um, also on that, do you think that 3D printing can show a potential scope in medical treatments in low income countries and alleviate those um, conditions that affect low-income countries the most? Definitely. I think there is a huge potential. And uh, this is not just a 3D printing technology. I mean, 3D printing technology is uh, a technique which helps us to manufacture things, uh, rather not uh, in a redistributed fashion. That means you don't have to rely on a huge manufacturing facility. You can print it. There are hobbies printers, which are people have been using to develop prosthetic devices in war torn countries such as Iraq, uh, Jordan, and other in African countries where people have been uh, printing prosthetic uh, devices to give it to uh, lots of children and even amputees. So that's already been happening. Uh, what is, uh, uh, and I think what we need to see is uh, the real impact will come from the other added technologies such as imaging technologies because access to CT and MRI scanning may not be accessible to the low income countries for every hospital. And this is where the innovation of using photogonometry, X-rays, ultrasound, uh, these technology offers a huge potential. We already shown an example where we are using mobile phones to scan a patient and then create a 3D printed device. I think that will definitely go far uh, the study we did was in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, where we actually had this patient. So we are remotely able to do this. So we can capture the information on a phone, relay back to UK, we can design uh, the device and send it for manufacturing locally. That also has an implication of reducing cost and accessibility, because cost is one aspect of it and accessibility is another aspect. Uh, by using mobile technologies, uh, we will be able to capture. I think there is a huge potential which can be offered. Uh, within the low-income countries, there has been incredible work in terms of management of various diseases, providing uh, low-cost insole for diabetic patients using 3D printing, monitoring their health using 3D printed devices. That's already been happening in India, in South America, and other countries, including China. So absolutely, there is a good potential. Yeah, I, I've heard that 3D printing can leverage a lot of other technologies. So like you said, using phones and software on phones that you can scan um, to send off kind of remotely to other areas and kind of leveraging the technology that um, kind of recognizes your facial features in the same way that they would like your limbs or whatnot. And so we know that the use of 3D printing has increased um, these past few years and there are many 3D printer brands and types. So um, do you think that um, 
as in the regulatory process, um, what are the stages in which these materials, these softwares or these printers have to go through in order to be approved and be distributed on the market? Yeah, again, very interesting question. Uh, because uh, these, this is a new technology, we are using them. The process is not going to be abruptly different than the conventional process itself. Uh, if you are starting from the imaging itself, we need to use software which are essentially um, regulatory approved, uh, which essentially shows you the output which is coming after processing of these images are reproducible. And they will generally be in class, this software will be classed under class one or class two, class two devices based on a level of complexity and decision making uh, this software actually do to the downturn processes of manufacturing. Uh, most software we use, they are class one certified. So absolutely, we have to have the software which are certified before we can process that information. Uh, and then that information goes to the manufacturing process and uh, uh, the, uh, further down uh, getting the quality control. There need to be a follow through process and we need to understand every single step where we are able to prove traceability and uh, reproducibility of what we manufacture. Um, whether it is done for a bespoke development or uh, large scale manufacturing, uh, that, that situation is not going to change. Uh, so these regulatory parts and processes for medical devices and implants is very much established right now. And uh, every regulator, whether they are FDA or MHRA or any other regulator in different countries, they widely accept and adopt these things. Um, in the prosthetic devices, they are less stringent when you're looking at class one devices. But as soon as the device comes to a patient, we had to ensure it is safe for them. Um, and that is where these regulations and regulatory aspects are actually important and playing a very important role. Yeah, just like any other medical device, it has to go through um, various stages of um, approval. Yeah. Um, and on another topic, so with 3D bioprinting, we know that it's a foreign material. It's something that the body can't really uh, recognize as its own. And so how would autoimmunity affect uh, 3D printed uh, organs? Yeah, again, uh, this uh, question or the answer to this question is not any different than using uh, tissue produced by other technologies. So if you are manufacturing technology by using non-3D printing product, it's exactly going to be the same. Uh, depends on the cells, where the cells are actually being used to develop these organs or tissues. If they're autologous cells, uh, we should anticipate less of an issue. However, if they're allogenic cells that can take taken from a different patient, uh, they will still face same issues as any other allogenic transplanted tissue. So we've talked a lot about um, tissues, human tissues and allogenic tissues. Um, do you think that there's any sort of usage for highly pure metals for 3D printing like copper and so on? Yeah, definitely. Uh, copper, silver, these materials are actually antibacterial. Uh, and within the medicine, these materials are actually being used to create composite polymers and 3D printed different types of devices or implants in order to show uh, antibacterial resistance, increased antibacterial resistance. There was a surge of activity during the COVID time uh, when people wanted to have antibacterial resistance to a lot of different things. And that time uh, there has been commercial activities and there has been uh, companies and industries who have been exploring and uh, commercializing these kind of ideas and devices where everyday uh, touch was important to open the door or close the door and how do we code it by using 3D printed jigs or devices has been explored. Uh, but at the same time, the same uh, material are also conducting. And so apart from antibacterial properties, the, that also provides an opportunity to further explore these materials for developing uh, biosensors or even developing different types of implants where uh, antibacterial resistance is warranted. Okay, um, 
very sadly we're out of time and we'll need to leave it there however if you could please provide us with your feedback about today's session by filling out our survey which will be sent to you after today's event it would be really greatly appreciated and also we do have another fascinating lecture titled why is dental health so important for children um, it's taking place on the 17th of may with our very own susan Perek, um, Associate Professor and Consultant in Pediatric Dentistry at UCL Eastman Dental Institute. And we would love to see you there. And the details for this event and how to register are now available on our website. Thank you for all your comments and questions. Thank you, Dr. Kalaska, for an excellent lecture. And I wish everyone a great evening and a great week. Thank you so much.